Hello, and thanks for checking out this in-depth review of the game Abe's Exodus. Uh, this is the second part of what is turning out to be a very slow review of the whole of the Oddworld series, but I am getting there. Uh, as a disclaimer, there might be some minor video quality issues, because Exodus is a complete nightmare to screen capture on PC, and for some reason it took a lot of foreign programs and, and cropping to get it to this state. But um, I can't complain, since it was my idea to make it, but just to let you know if it looks weird at any point. This is a review of the PlayStation 1 version of the game, and even though I recorded it on a PC, I did use a controller, so any references to control schemes or anything like that will be uh, in regards to the PlayStation 1 version, because that's the version I consider to be the, the ultimate version, uh, for reasons that hopefully I'll explain. In the review, I'll be making comparisons to Abe's Odyssey, which is the first game in the Oddworld series, and I'll make reference to criticisms that I fleshed out a lot more in the previous episode. So my advice would be to watch that one first. Um, this is also a pri primarily a gameplay review, so um, I have another episode that goes into narrative choices in the game at large. Uh, so you could check that out as well if you want sort of the, the whole Abe's Exodus experience. But for now, that's my plugging done, so let's get on with it. Abe's Exodus is the 1998 bonus game to Abe's Odyssey. Uh, the original vision for the Odd World series was to have a quintology of games, with each game documenting the rise of a hero from a different underclass species of the planet Oddworld. Each of these heroes would then go on to rally their entire species to rise against the Gluckins, a race who has taken control over Oddworld and enslaved most of the inhabitants of it. Every game in the series would have a bonus game, which would complement the main instalment by being an extra adventure of the character we'd just played. Abe's Exodus was the first bonus game of the series, being a bonus game to Abe's Odyssey. Once again, we follow Abe, who is a Madokin. Having just escaped Rupture Farms and saved all the Madokins trapped there, which we assume has to be the case for obvious canon reasons, Exodus starts almost immediately after he returns back from Rupture Farms. After being knocked unconscious during his celebratory welcome, he is informed by the ghosts of his ancestors that Gluckins elsewhere are digging up the graves of his ancestors to use in their highly addictive brew called Soulstorm Brew, which is being used as a tool to enslave Madokins by keeping them too addicted to revolt. So Abe travels to Soulstorm Brewery, the Gluckin owned brewery, to destroy it and save the Madokins who are enslaved there. Although there feels like more plot in this game, and there certainly are more cutscenes overall, with Odyssey totaling at 21 minutes and Exodus clocking at 35 minutes in total, the initial time it takes before you take control of Abe is actually the same as the first game. I'm uncertain if this was a conscious choice. Uh, Odyssey's opening has less action in it, but it takes a few minutes because it uses its time to build an atmosphere and let us into the bleakness of Rupture Farms by showing us it. Exodus brings us into its world with lots of dialogue and plot to set up the story. So the tone of the opening is much more fast paced and feels more full, but the time establishing everything is actually the same. I think if this was a decision taken by Lorne Lanning and the crew, then it's a great solution to the problem of sequelitis. They know they can't just use the same tricks from Odyssey, so they create a plot heavier story while also not punishing the player with a slower intro. The story in Exodus explores the antagonists and workings of the world significantly more than Odyssey ever did. Although I respect the thought of going into building the world further and the swiftness that Oddworld Inhabitants deals these cutscenes out and gets any world building out of the way, I have some issues with some of the creative choices that they've taken. I think Exodus starts to leak in bad habits that will go on to damage the whole world of Oddworld, mostly in the significant increase of gags and comedy. Although I think Exodus handles the balance of funny to serious well and is complementary to the world that Odyssey laid out, it was the start of a slippery slope into the sequels becoming pretty farcical. But this is an issue I go into further in another video, so for now let's take a look at the gameplay of Exodus and see what's been reshuffled from the original. In my review of Abe's Odyssey, I ran through the control scheme and why I thought it was an elegant way to hold a lot of controller inputs for Abe. Abe can do a lot of things, he can run, jump, sneak, possess, and there's a whole host of voice commands given to the player, which in total gives you about 15 things to make Abe do. With the number of buttons available on the controller, you can tell that it's a little bit top heavy, so Lorne Lanning and team have managed to fit this in all surprisingly well. The way they do this is they use the face buttons for each action, but they change what action the player performs based on what shoulder button they're also holding. In this way you don't have individual inputs for each move, but you have categories of input. So out of the four shoulder buttons, moves relating to running take at one, sneaking another, conversational commands on one, and then whistling commands on the last one. I'll call these move categories profiles from now on, because it's what Assassin's Creed calls its control system, and I think the original Oddworld games actually mirror the Assassin's Creed control scheme in many ways. The way they've gone about it not only makes the controls manageable on a controller, but also has a consistent design to not confuse the player. Oddworld inhabitants thankfully keep up this design choice, but have made some changes to Abe's moveset within the system. 
In terms of physical movement, Abe remains very similar to how he did in the first game. He has new animations for different enemy interactions, and he can interact with different environmental objects in the game. For instance, he can use valves to open doors, ride minecarts, and possess a whole host of new creatures. But in terms of actual moves he can do differently, they haven't changed at all. The major change is the addition of a secondary group of conversational options, which have replaced the whistling profile. The whistling profile in Odyssey was used for memory-based puzzles, where Abe had to listen to a musical pattern and then whistle it back. This is now gone. The team seems to have thought that this couldn't carry a whole new game, and so have switched it out with an entirely new set of conversational abilities, and I'm inclined to agree with the choice. Memory puzzles weren't particularly gripping in the first place, and although a nice substitute for Madocking commands during the mid to later half of the original game, after the first few puzzles they became quite repetitive and weren't particularly engaging. These new conversational options include slapping, okay. comforting, Sorry. Okay. a stop command, stop it. and a greeting for multiple Madokans. Oh, yeah. you, 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 you. Slapping and comforting may not sound like conversational options, but they're mostly used to interact with Madokins, so I'm going to call them that for now. Right off the bat, it's obvious that the ability to greet multiple Madokins is a great move for the sequel, because we all have horrible memories of leading Madokins individually through puzzles, and sometimes this was to the advantage of the puzzle, it would make it more tense and would increase the difficulty, but the increased potential repetition and bad checkpoint system made this positive quickly fail in comparison to frustration if you started dying. There's also a lot more Madokins in the game, with 300 compared to Odyssey's 99, so there's a lot more Madokin leading this time around. The other commands relate to the new Madokin emotion system. Madokins now have emotional states, and this isn't just a nice bit of wallpaper dressing, but affects how much or little control you can now have over Madokins. You can tell a big concern from the dev team was worrying about the game becoming stale. They focused their efforts on changing the most repetitive actions of the previous game, which was leading Madokins around and whistling puzzles. It was a smart move and reinvigorates what were even repetitive tasks by the end of the last game. The Madokins can now be in seven physical states in the game. Angry, depressed, normal, sick, high, blind, and suicidal. Normal Madokins will act normally. They will follow orders and agree to all commands like they did in Odyssey. Angry Madokins will not follow orders and will slap Madokins and pull levers around them if provoked. Madokins can be made angry if they're slapped. They are cured by comforting them. Depressed Madokins will not follow any commands, nor interact with the world around them. Madokins will become depressed if other Madokins die around them. Depressed Madokins can then become suicidal if Madokins around them die. They are cured by comforting them. Suicidal Madokins are Madokins who are depressed and have had another Madokin die around them. They will begin to hit themselves in the head until they die. You cannot stop this process once it starts. Sick Madokins are Madokins that won't respond to any commands and will moan if you try and talk to them. They need a special power to cure them. Blind Madokins can't see, and will respond to Abe's commands, but won't have stopped to avoid dangers. If they are told to walk while Abe is in one direction, they will continue to walk in that direction until told otherwise, walking off edges and into traps. And finally there's High Madokins, who won't respond to any commands from Abe. They'll follow Abe around, constantly running around him. This will alert enemies if they're any nearby, and they are made high by being on the same screen as Laughing Gas. They can be cured by slapping them while they're away from gas, but if you return to the room area that has gas in them, they'll become high again. So these changes add one hell of a lot of variation when it comes to leading Madokins around, and it's no longer a case of simply getting them from A to B and avoiding enemies, but now the Madokins have limitations for how much they'll respond. And the creators use this emotion system in consistently creative ways. Blind Madokins are puzzles of using voice commands to have them avoid obstacles. Depressed and angry Madokins present an issue, since the player must get close to them and comfort them before they'll follow any commands, instead of just calling them from across the screen. Angry Madokins in particular will often be activating levers to create obstacles and a danger on screen. In one particularly great set piece, there's a bunch of angry Madokins crowded around each other. As soon as the player enters the screen, one Madokin will slap his neighbour, who will slap the one next to him, and so on and so on and so on, making all of the Madokins angry. There's another angry Madokin who is pulling a lever to alternate electrical walls to slow the player as they have to rush to comfort the Madokins before they kill each other. As soon as a Madokin is killed, then they all get depressed and will start to commit suicide, so it's a race against time. In fact, I think this set piece above all demonstrates just how flexible and interesting the new Madokin emotional mechanic is. It demonstrates how Madokins are now obstacles to the player's progress and not simply optional collectibles that they previously were. Similarly, Madokins can go from one state to another. Other games may have simply had angry Madokins and depressed Madokins and simply left it at that. You cure them and then they're normal again, and they can't go back. 
been in Exodus. Madokins can be angry, then when a Madokin dies they can become depressed, then after that become suicidal. Even if you comfort a Madokin, make them happy again, and then slap them, they can become angry again. High Madokins can be cured by slapping them, and then if you lead them back to the gas they'll become high again. If you continue slapping a high Madokin once he's cured, then he'll get then he'll get angry, and then get depressed, and then get suicidal. Because the Madokin emotional states can change so quickly, it means puzzles can quickly become much more complicated on the fly. Everything could be going smoothly, but one false move and all the Madokins are pissed off and trying to kill each other. It makes puzzle solving feel much more dynamic and interesting than the previous instalment, and amazingly at the same time, there's never really a situation where this breaks the game. Outside of their emotional states, Madokins also have more abilities than before. Madokins can now activate levers and valves, which not only adds to the increased obstacles I mentioned before, with angered Madokins activating hazards to kill Abe, but it also means there's multiple puzzles which require Abe to command Madokins to activate levers that he can't reach by telling them to work. Uh, work is a new voice command that has been added to the primary conversation profile, the one that includes hello, wait, and follow me. Previously that profile included a, a whine, which has now been removed. As I mentioned in my Odyssey review, I think the greatest strength of the Oddworld Inhabitants people is taking simple mechanics and pushing them as hard as they can go. I mean, these guys really know how to design simple mechanics with extending consequences. By simply adding in something, by adding in something as simple as emotional states and one extra Madokin ability, such as being able to activate objects, this creates an expanse of puzzle possibilities. These were definitely the smartest additions to the game, and it continues to demonstrate the developers, you know, have a real grasp on how their gameplay mechanics work. And the Madokins of Oddworld aren't the only thing that's changed about the game. There's a whole host of new creatures to Exodus that affect your playstyle, and even the old creatures make a return in new forms. The returning creatures are the Sligs, Scrabs, Paramites, and Slogs. These all play exactly the same, but with the biggest change being the ability to now possess Paramites and Scrabs. I mentioned in the Odyssey review that I thought uh, it was a good idea that the Scrabs and Paramites hadn't been made possessable because it differs them a lot from the other creatures you'd run into, like the Slogs and Sligs, but at the same time it would um, really lessen their impact and make the puzzles a lot easier. Uh, it's clear that the team have gone to some steps to trying to lessen the impact that I thought it would have. There are a lot of security orbs around to control when you can possess them, and Scrabs and Paramites don't die when you lose control of them. The team has structured the level so they can still keep tabs on when you control Scrabs and Paramites, and this means that whenever they want to capture the same intensity from the first game, they can do so. Scrabs will still chase you on sight, and Paramites will still need to be guided away from groups if you want them to remain sedate and harmless. You can use all their abilities as well, even the ones that you saw them doing in Odyssey. The Scrabs have a big spinning attack that's called the Shred ability, and you can use that to fight other Scrabs whenever you run into them. Um, the problem with this system is the game isn't made for this kind of fighting and it's very hard to place your scrab in the area it needs to fight and so you'll often just get killed. Uh, paramites are social creatures so you can ask other paramites to follow you and can even tell them to work in order to pull levers like you can with the Madokins. The extra control causes some issues however. Firstly the scrabs and paramites have way less impact than they did in the first game because they no longer juxtapose the rest of the game. In the first game, when Abe left the industrious areas of Rupture Farms and there was a shift in Odyssey to the natural world of Oddworld, it was striking not only visually, but also from a gameplay standpoint. You were no longer able to control your enemies, you could only avoid your enemies, and it made you feel incredibly vulnerable and made you rethink your entire playstyle. You couldn't just simply possess a creature and piss about, you now had to actually run away from them. In Exodus, when you leave the factory to the nature of Oddworld, you're doing the same thing as you did when you left. You possess creatures to kill other creatures, command friendlies around to pull levers that you can't access. The game doesn't really change in any fundamental way, it simply replaces locations and character models. Oddworld inhabitants have avoided making the puzzles easy, but instead they haven't avoided making the puzzles just seem very familiar, and so it kills a lot of the interest that the new area could have brung, since you're doing effectively the same things. In fact, it feels like the game starts twice. All over again the game teaches you how to possess paramites and scrabs to solve simple puzzles and this simply isn't as interesting. We already did this while we were in the mines area. In Odyssey, the first time you come across a scrab, you had to run for your life and with a paramite it was much the same. Now you simply stay out of sight and possess them and it starts to feel old. And very rarely are you running for your life when you come into contact with the paramites and scrabs. 
Um, in fact, Paramites and Scrabs will stand in place whenever you start to possess them. So whenever you want the chase to be over, you can simply chant them into submission while you plan your next move. They did stop in the previous game when you ch possess when you began chanting, but they would only stop in place, and then as soon as you stop, they'd run after you. So in this version, you can start possessing, they'll stand in place, get possessed, and then you can just wander them off to the next screen, unpossess them, and then start running again. And it really kills the tension. It, it almost feels like Oddworld inhabitants didn't really know what to do with Scrabs and Paramites, but felt they needed to change them in some way. Um, and I personally feel this change removed what made them interesting in the first place without adding anything extra in. There are also tweaks to the Sligs and Slogs. Uh, the Slogs now have a baby version of themselves called the Sloglets, and uh, these Sloglets run slower, and uh, they're less dangerous than the adult Slogs, but they can't be shot at by Sligs because the Slig will shoot over them. Uh, Sligs now aren't just restricted to just being in metal pants with a gun. Uh, they come in a flying version, which can throw bombs and travel vertically across screens, and this allows for uh, increased exploration around the levels. There is also a pantless version of Sligs, and pantless version of the Sligs don't really change your experience that much other than having a delay in when Sligs will be able to respond to your presence as they must now crawl over to get their pants. Uh, this appears to be more of a world building tool since they only appear for a few levels and don't come into play with the puzzles that much at all. The new creatures of Oddworld are the Fleeches, Slurgs, Gluckens and Greeters. I made a note in the uh, Odyssey review that I just think that the original creatures in that game really cover all bases needed when it comes to you know, creating uh, challenges for Abe, and the new creatures completely just fill in any of those gaps left in potential character types. Slurgs are just slugs that when stepped on will alert enemies to your presence. Fleeches are worms that have large tongues which can be used to climb ledges and hunt Abe, so they can follow him across the horizontal and, and verticality of the screen. Uh, they have a time delay to their kills, so they won't one-hit kill Abe, but instead they will slowly kill Abe by slapping him with their tongue, and it takes about seven hits before he dies. As a side note, you can see Oddworld Inhabitants have a really great ability of telling the player uh, information as simply as possible, and one of the things they've definitely clearly tried to do is avoid having a HUD. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what a HUD is, it's the heads-up display, so it's the sort of icons that give you data about health and such in other games. Uh, and the Oddworld games haven't had HUDs at this point, and, and even though we've had no HUD, we've never been confused uh, about information that's, that we need. Uh, Abe's health, for instance, has always been a one-hit kill, and, uh, and so the game has ha never had any reason to tell you how much health you have. But now, obviously, they've added in a health system. And what they do is, instead of just having a health bar, they use the pitch of Abe's voice to show you how close to death he is. And it becomes increasingly higher pitched as he comes closer to death. Uh, it's not entirely accurate, and like I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ever be confident enough to to judge it until the last hit, but I mean, it shows that with just a few audio cues, you're told everything you need to know about your character's health. And I mean, it shows the skill of Oddworld inhabitants that they can add in an entirely new dynamic for your health system and, and demonstrate it to the player immediately without you ever being confused or without any use for a HUD. You see, you see that they do this with everything to how they illustrate how much ammo you have, how they teach you the controls, uh, how they show character emotions and, and highlight secret areas. Everything is done within the world itself. The Fleech behaviour is kind of a mix between the bees and slogs. Uh, the bees aren't in this game, so they seem to have just taken their behaviour of doing multiple hits to Abe and, and putting on the Fleeches. Uh, they'll slowly kill you like the bees, but they'll follow you around the level based on if they can hear you like the slogs. Except now there's a verticality to the hunt that you simply don't get with creatures like slogs, which adds in a lot of tension. Fleeches appear in the temple and natural areas where you would usually run into scrabs and paramites. And the Fleeches kind of replace the Scrabs and Paramites in terms of the provider of tense action. So they can't be possessed, and because of that they add in a lot of what the changes to the Scrabs and the Paramites left out. Uh, the Greeters are robots with laser walls in front of them that function in the same way as the regular laser walls, but they can electrocute you instantly if you move while the laser is moving over you. They effectively are the laser walls, but um, they can insta-kill you since they have to electrocute you, and the laser walls in the game will usually have a bomb come after you, so there's a bit of a delay and you can get away from it. Uh, they also add in a lot more character to the puzzles, and uh, they're more faster paced because they're moving as well as their laser, so it adds a lot of uh, tension to the sequences, but it seems like something that could have been achieved with the tools the game already had, but they take nothing away, so they're a nice addition. Of all the new creatures, Gluckins are the only ones that are possessable. 
Gluckins are a very interesting addition to the team. The uh, Gluckins feel like the hierarchical step up from the Slig to Slog relationship. Uh, this time they can command Slig's around, giving them orders to pull levers. So it feels like you're riding around a guard dog, but this guard dog comes with a gun and opposable thumbs, which means there's more options for them to do. They can kill and they can pull levers and, and, and use elevators and stuff like that. This could have been an issue since we've honestly almost already seen this before with Abe being able to order around Madokins, but the designers have made the Gluckins playstyle stand out enough to, to change it up. Gluckins have no arms, so they are unable to hoist up ledges, use objects, or defend themselves in any way. They can only use slicks to do everything for them. And the game will throw interesting problems at them, such as having to order a slig to kill incoming slogs while a drill slowly descends onto them from above. It's another social and command based character, but it takes away abilities from the player and that gives that whole new feeling of tension and vulnerability, which we haven't really seen before. Whilst Abe and Sligs can order other creatures around, they can also at the same time shoot and run away and hide. Whereas Gluckins simply can't do that, you feel that everything rests in your orders. There are issues every now and again with the AI being delayed, so sometimes you'll just die because the slig didn't respond on time or the slogs were coming out a certain pattern which meant that the slig stopped shooting while they were coming out or simply it will just take too long and the drill will come down for you but it's it's an interesting enough concept to put up with any issues and, and they are very rare issues. As you can see there's a, there's a lot of characters in the game now and Oddworld Inhabitants are clearly great at working within very fine parameters because all their character types work off the same systems. I mean they're, they're all programmed to kill Abe and they have some social factors, but the number of ways they can go about this is, is pretty is pretty impressive. Sligs attack with range. Uh, regular sligs do so from the ground, and flying sligs do so from the air. Slogs and scrabs will also pursue you, but slogs can attack in groups, whereas if a scrab comes across another scrab, it will stop to fight them instead, ignoring you. Uh, Fleeches will also attack on sight, but they can track you anywhere on the screen, and not just on the same level that they see you on. Paramites will hunt you as well, but only if they're in groups, and greeters will hunt you if you move near them. In my Odyssey review, I, I said the developers had taken a very small number of actions that the enemies were capable of doing and split them into individual creatures that changed the gameplay drastically with each encounter. I think here they've taken that a step further, and by adding in the abilities for enemies to now climb ledges and fly, the scope of the enemies has increased drastically. Uh, the number of enemies is absolutely incredible, and, and especially the visual design of the enemies and the creative creativity that's gone behind it is, is one of the best in any game I've ever played. They're all different from one another and add a completely new facet to the game. The increased roster does have one issue, however. I still feel that the spread they have is so great that there's a lot of crossover now. The developers have clearly been wary of this. They've shown great restraint by leaving certain enemies, like the slogs, still unpossessable, as the issue would be that possessing slogs would make them no different to possessing slicks or scrabs. Uh, clearly they want every encounter to be different, but unlike Odyssey, where you couldn't use the same tactics to tackle any of the other enemies, they kind of can, like Paramites, Scrabs and Sligs can all be possessed, uh, they can order things around, they can defend themselves, and playing as, as, as characters like these kind of feel like the same scenario but with new skins. Um, it seems to be only the original characters from Odyssey that have been affected, and they seem to have been changed the most to stop crossover with the new characters, which almost doesn't make a lot of sense since it surely should be the new characters fitting in with the original roster. And because of this increase in possessable creatures and, and that the fact that they can now order each other around, a, a lot of your playtime is spent effectively doing the same things. Um, you know, new additions like the Galuckins add in tweaks to the formula that force you to play differently and, and experience new feelings of panic since you can't defend yourself. The increased choices are, are wonderful, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining, but it does leave your minute to minute gameplay feeling very familiar after a while. Like. Even if you're a different creature, after you've yelled the 50th order to attack, it, it can't help but seem like you're doing the same things. And I, I think that editing down the creatures certainly wouldn't have been a, 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 the, the worst choice in the world. Plus, in the bid to create diversity, some creatures have simply just been nerfed for no reason. I, I still can't think of a good reason why scrabs and paramites are possessable, other than just to make them different. But different isn't always good, and the scramble to tweak everything has left some of the best ideas from Odyssey thrown out the window. So as you can tell, there's a lot more to do now than in Odyssey. I, I commend Oddworld Inhabitants for creating such a huge game with so many things to do. There are new creatures, tons of areas, new rideable action set pieces such as minecarts, you can possess farts, you visit eight locations now instead of the five from the last game. 
And the whole game takes up two discs now instead of one, obviously in the original PS1 version. And there's there's entirely new gameplay mechanics thrown in that work brilliantly out of the box. And, and the insane thing is that it was all developed in eight months, which is way shorter than the first game. They have, they've thrown everything at the wall and there's there's so much going on in this game. If I talked about everything, this review would literally be hours long, but I'll, you know, I'll spare your patience and, and my self-indulgence by not doing that. Um, the overall problem is is this. The game lacks one of the most important things that the first one had, and that's simply pacing. As I discussed in the first game, every level introduces a new gameplay element to the player. Rupture Farms introduces the basics, Stockyard introduces stealth, Temples introduce action elements and social manipulation due to the attack patterns of the Scrabs and Paramites when they're in groups or when they're by themselves. And finally, when you return back to Rupture Farms, it throws everything you've learned at you. It it's a really great logical introduction of game mechanics that ends with the crescendo of putting everything you learn together. It's, it's really great games design. But Exodus doesn't work that way. More levels, more mechanics, more enemies, more everything. The game was designed with more in mind. Watching the behind the scenes, you can see that this is the prime goal of the dev team. They constantly boast about how there's more of everything. And in terms of bulk quantity, this is great. More puzzles means more fun. But you can only have so much fun, and Exodus can simply just go on too long. And I, I think it has something to do with the way pacing is viewed in games compared to other mediums. Uh, ap apologies for the minor segue, but I, I think it's good to defend my points if I'm going to use uh, nearly an hour of your time with my opinions. So obviously click here to, to skip ahead all this part, but I'm just going to go on a little thing about pacing in games. Uh, movies, books and, and music are judged on a variety of factors, but, but a key one is always pacing. If, if a song delays too long before hitting an emotional chorus, or if a movie has too many unrelated scenes, and if, if a book does the same, these mediums will all be criticised. And in a way this makes sense, because these mediums are usually more reliant on story and, and, and emotion, especially in regards to the music, uh, than games are, which mostly rely on mechanics. The ways that games can hold your attention, the way you interact with them, is, is very different to every other medium, you know. Uh, obviously in films and, and, and music you're passively being told information or you're having an, an emotional experience created for you and and, th and that can lose your attention much quicker. Whereas games primarily focus on fun and challenge which is much easier to sustain for, for longer since it involves your interaction and you can more easily get lost in it. But pacing in games, although less immediately an issue, is still very important because fun and challenge can run out eventually. You know, more isn't just better. Nobody can exactly say that collecting a hundred statues in Far Cry 3 was interesting, but it was put in the game as a means to create content and it was seen as a completely valid addition. And we see this constantly, especially with the Ubisoft open world games that have just become checklists. You know, content is the issue and content is not by itself valuable. Portal, for instance, is two hours long, and it can be much more memorable and engaging than a hundred hour long RPG. Uh, maybe that's just me, but this issue with pacing is what ruins Exodus for me. Having played it, I became aware of just how random the puzzle placement seems to be. And this isn't to say that it's badly enforced, like the game tells you how to do everything before you start each puzzle. But around the halfway mark, it completely loses structure. There's, there's no theming to the levels like before in terms of gameplay. Every level is really wonderfully rendered and looks different, but what you actually spend your time doing is, is very much the same. So Slig Barracks has more Sligs in it, but then entire areas of other levels will also be very Slig heavy when they, when they need a Slig heavy puzzle. And especially in Slig Barracks, what you spend your time doing isn't particularly Slig based or different to anywhere else in the game. Uh, the game bounces around between stealth puzzles, action sequences, possession puzzles, Madokin emotion based puzzles, and it kind of feels like someone just throwing out the bag of party tricks until it runs out. And because levels lack any kind of gameplay enforcement or make you feel like you're learning something, around the midway mark it simply feels like an unending sequence of puzzles. You, you don't feel like you're progressing, and, and sure you're shutting down the different areas of the facility to get to the boiler room, but the activities you do to get there seem completely unrelated. You go to an area, do a whole host of puzzles, and then unlock more areas. Uh, for instance, in Odyssey, when you enter the Monsanic temples, you knew that you were going in there to turn on temple locks to light fires in order to reach Big Face. The temple levels follow a similar pattern in Exodus as well, but you kind of just show up next to an ancient temple, activate the temple, and then you just run into the ghost that gave you the task to get the whole story going in the first place, and then you just gain special powers to cure the drunkenness of the Madokins back in the mines, even though you didn't even know that that's what you would have achieved in the first place. And then you just go to the next level. By the time you're in Fico Depot, Slig Barracks and Boneworks, there's none of that feedback to give you a sense of accomplishment. You, you go into a level, you do some stuff, and then the level is complete, and you're not entirely sure why you were there. You find yourself pulling a switch, turning a valve, or 
saving my dockings and then the level would be over and the puzzle would be complete and I'd be told to move on with the adventure but I didn't really know why it was just kind of the level was just done now so you walk into rooms and are given whatever puzzle the dev has come up with and this puzzle might not be used for several hours but it's just time to to mix it up again so you don't get bored and it, it's interesting at first and I, I don't want to claim claim that you know trying to make me not bored is a bad thing but the lack of story direction and gameplay building just makes it feel like busy work and you know it's, um, it's most it's mostly bad in comparison to odyssey because odyssey already solved this problem i mean in odyssey you always knew why you were in an area you know step one you saw a gluckin plan to kill all the madokins so you leave rupture farms or you'll die and then step two you're then told you need to attain an ancient power by completing the temples in order to stop rupture farms and then step three you get that ancient power and return to rupture farms and blow it up it's it's very simple but i mean what's the structure in exodus i mean step one go and save madokins and blow up brewery step two get blown into surrounding countryside i mean step three randomly stumble across temple and then complete tasks to find a healing potion which you didn't know you needed or existed but you do actually need in order to get to the next area uh, step four, you go to Fico Depot, uh, even though we don't know what that is yet. And then step five, uh, you blow up Fico Depot to unlock access to Soulstorm Brewery, even though the information to do that was in a cutscene that we saw, but Abe didn't. And and you see the issue. It, 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 you know, it feels like a game. You're, you're in a level, so complete it. Whereas before it felt like Abe was doing something because it was his own motivation to do it. Now it feels like a game. You're just you're just put in a level and you know that because you bought the game, you have to complete it. Levels are thrown at you, puzzles are thrown at you, and you do them because they're quite fun and you paid for the right to do so. But that but this isn't acceptable in comparison to Abe's Odyssey. I mean that that was an adventure and Abe's Exodus is just a map pack. And this feeling of aimlessness, you know, isn't isolated to the story itself. It bleeds into the levels as well. These places don't feel like locations, they just feel like endless hub worlds. For example, around halfway through the game you enter Fico Depot. Um, Fico Depot connects you to Slig Barracks, Boneworks and Soulstorm Brewery. And the idea is you must complete Slig Barracks, Boneworks and an additional level in Fico Depot in order to you know, progress to, to Soulstorm Brewery. So in that regard, Fico Depot is a hub world, hub world containing three other worlds. So let's call it Hub A. You enter Slig Barracks and after an introductory level you go to another hub area which has four levels that you must complete in order to open a locked door that will lead you out of Slick Barracks, so let's call this area Hub B. You enter one of these levels and you're presented with four more doors, making this level within a level another hub, and we'll call this one Hub C. And once you've completed the four levels of Hub C, you then go back to Hub B. In Hub B you have to complete the other three doors, all of which are also hubs containing multiple levels. Once you've done all these additional hubs, Hub B is complete. You then leave Hub B, or Slick Barracks, to go back to Fico Depot. You then have to go on to complete Boneworks, which, surprise surprise, has exactly the same setup. Now Odyssey did this as well, it had Zulugs and Rupture Farms, and it had additional levels that were in the temple, so you had to complete five levels before you could leave them. But these hubs were only ever two layers deep, and every door you went into at least only had one single level to complete, not an entirely new hub. In the return to Rupture Farms, you had to go through three zoo legs, which would be the equivalent of three hubs. But you would complete them one after the other, and then move on to the next station. And it always felt like you were moving forward through the facility because you were never backtracking to previous hubs. Exodus's hubs are also concentrated in one area. It feels completely unrewarding to go through all the trouble of completing a huge area like Slig Barracks, only return to Fico Depot, somewhere that you may have left several hours ago. Odyssey never made you feel like you were going in circles like this, it made you feel like you were moving forward through a facility. Whereas Exodus just feels like a bunch of levels crammed into the smallest area possible. You never move forward, you just go into a room and then out of a room, over and over and over again until you complete enough puzzles to proceed, and it completely destroys the sense of adventure. I mean, one compliment I, I can offer is that, you know, one thing I did like is that I I'm impressed by the lack of glitches and unwinnable scenarios that are in Exodus. I mean, in the first game, I noted there were a few points where the player would have to kill themselves because they found themselves in scenarios where they couldn't complete the game. And Exodus has these as well, and there are a handful more unwinnable scenarios than Odyssey. Uh, it's certainly not perfect, but the fact that Exodus is so big and has so few is a testament to how talented Oddworld inhabitants are. A few issues can be seen here where the Madokins are all dead so I can't unlock a door, or I've drank all the Soulstorm brew so I can't possess a fart to kill some slicks, or I just rolled past this slick to enter an area but then couldn't escape. 
I mean, it's impressive that the game is so well made. One, one of the reasons I had a few errors was because of the new quick save feature, which allows you to quick save wherever you want. Compared to Odyssey, which had pretty dodgy checkpoints, uh, the quick save feature is a godsend because it allows you to create checkpoints as you go. And Exodus still has dodgy checkpoints, but because you can make your own, it's not really a problem. Uh, unfortunately, the freedom of the quick save feature, as well as the ability to only create single files, is a bit of an annoyance, and it holds it back from being perfect. Players can quick save wherever they want. I mean, this could be anything from standing still to falling to your death. And, and once you quick save, you can't unquick save. You can only go from the beginning of the level. And I'm not sure if it's for technical reasons why you can't quick save more than one file. Um, it's very possible that since the lead platform was the PS1, then maybe the memory card just couldn't hold that much data. But it's quite annoying that you can't create more than one file and you can't just load from one of the game's own preset checkpoints. You have to restart the whole level instead. Adding in more quick save files or, or allowing you to load in-game checkpoints would have fixed this issue, but it just means that if you quick save badly, you have to deal with a tedious checkpoint system again. And, you know, we've already had that with Odyssey, so it's not really a problem. It's good that they went as far as they reasonably could at the time to help with restarts, but there were definitely a few fixes that could have been in there to make it perfect. The, I mean, the problem is if players are ignorant of obstacles, which they probably will be because they haven't played the game yet, then, you know, these can have horribly unforeseen consequences, such as rolling past this slig, you know, quick saving, and then you can't leave because the slig's outside the door. And it can, it can, it can be quite, it can be quite tedious if you know, because it's not really your fault that you didn't see it coming. I haven't really had time to focus on everything Abe's Exodus adds, and, and I reasonably won't. The fact is, nothing about the way Abe controls is particularly new in this instalment. He has new dialogue options, but aside from that, many of the additions of the game are external to Abe. You can possess farts at certain points to use as ranged attacks. You can slap locks to open doors, and then these can give you the ability to turn invisible, you can stand on buttons to activate stuff, and you can use teleportation doors, you can watch funny news shows, there's new enemies and interactable objects, levels and Madokin types. You can ride a minecart, which is a replacement for Elam from the first game. I, I didn't talk about Elam last time, and that's mostly because Elam wasn't fundamentally game-changing, he just adds in a, a faster way of playing, and, and this is what the minecart does, it adds in the same flow. Uh, in the same way that you'd ride Elam in a hectic set piece and then get off to solve a puzzle, in this game you ride the minecart in an explosive trip and then get out at certain points on route to solve a puzzle and save some Madokins. Which you can do if you want, of course, but you can also just plough through killing everything and, that, and that's also cool as well. Uh, the Karma system returns and there's even more Madokins to save, and the Madokins are spread across a huge array of levels, so it feels much the same Madokin density as before, so you're always distracted with having to save Madokins who are enjoyable to kill and save as ever. The game has a different ending depending on how well you did and how many Madokins you saved, and it, and it works with the same clever approach to morality that I praised in Odyssey. And you may notice that that last bit was sort of just info dumping a lot of stuff, and in a way that's how I want to sum up Abe's Exodus. There's there's no groundbreaking new abilities or anything game-changing, but all of the praises of Abe's movement and controls and enemy AI still apply here. The game is very much the same as Odyssey, and with it come all the compliments. But the reliance on more stuff does make the sequel worse than Odyssey, in my opinion. More stuff brings the consequence of the game being a lot less structured, and at first the whole thing is exciting as you play with all these new tools and as the game combines them in puzzles, but near the end the game starts to run out of steam. It's simply just worse paced, goes on too long, and feels like a jumble of puzzle mechanics rather than the steady introduction of gameplay elements that we found in the last one. It's entirely possible that given more than eight months of development time, the game might have been a bit cleaner, maybe ideas would have been taken out or cleaned up more, and maybe we'd see Abe play completely differently, you know, we'll never know. And I can't knock how much care and craft has gone into creating this world. The new characters and levels feel entirely fitting in the world, everything's top notch in terms of look and feel, but for all the points I really enjoyed with Odyssey, you know, it's great pacing, slowly increasing gameplay elements, and the clear feeling that you're on an adventure, and Exodus, on the other hand, just tries to pile a little too much on its plate, and it, and it just left me feeling full and at times confused, to use a poor analogy. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the review, if you managed to brave it out to the end. Uh, I mean, if you if you want to subscribe, you can, that would be really nice. And uh, But just know that I, I make these in my own spare time for fun, or whenever I think of something interesting, or when I'm just bored, so that's why they're so sporadic. Uh, at some point I'll be continuing with the series and looking at Munchie's Odyssey, but whether or not that'll be the next thing I, I, I simply don't know. But um, either way, thanks, thanks for watching and hopefully you'll be uh, back in the future at some completely random point.